we've got to start thinking in terms of systems instead of tools. I'd like to welcome Justin DeRose to the Productivity is Podcast. Justin, thanks for joining me today. Hey, thanks for having me on, Mike. So you are, I believe, the first guest I've had on that I've recommended their podcast on this program as my Productivity is Podcast pick of the week. So that this is a this is a this is an inaugural thing. I've, I've got others that are uh, going to be on. At least let's put it this way. At least before I had them on the podcast, because I've had Mark and Angel on the podcast, I've had Courtney Carver, and they have podcasts now. Everyone's jumping on that train. But but I haven't had someone who I've listened to the podcast say, you know what, I need to get Justin on the show. So thanks for joining me today. Well, it's an absolute pleasure to be here. I know I was thrilled to hear you recommend my podcast. Uh, it's I've actually listened to Productivity as off and on throughout quite a number of years. When I first got into Productivity, I know you were one of the main names in the game at that point, probably seven, eight years ago now. So it's a pleasure to be here and chat with you. It's pretty amazing the way that whole space has evolved over the years. And I was talking to someone about this and it wasn't like, it, it was just like how I remember going to the OmniFocus setup back when OmniFocus 2 was coming out. And it was, you know, Asia, Tan from Asian Efficiency, David Sparks was there, um, you know, Merlin was there. And it was one of those things where there was like the people have been doing it for a while. And then those of us who were fairly new to the game and now we're kind of a bit of the old guard, which is kind of Tan and I are like, we've been doing this for a while. So it's kind of interesting to see the evolution of the space. Can you touch on and we'll get into like, you know, the podcast, of course, and we'll get into your community. But you've obviously been following productivity for a while. What are some of the things that you've noticed that have either trended one way or another or that's evolved in the years you've been following it online? Yeah, that's a that's a really interesting question. And honestly, the way I've I've seen it play out, I really got involved in the productivity space. Oh, probably it's probably 2008, 2009 or so when I was first introduced to like getting things done. And I really got like I was really wanting to buy OmniFocus, but it was too expensive for me as a college student when I was hearing David and Katie talk about it on Mac Power Users and all that fun stuff, but over time, I've really seen this trend emerge where productivity was, hey, there's here's all these life hacks. Here's these little tips and tricks yep. and things that you can do to improve your life, to do things a little bit faster, to get more done. And then that really turned from people who were just passionate about productivity and sharing things that they've learned or are experimenting with into like a total industry to where it was kind of let's sell you on these things that are going to make your life way better and way bigger and you could do more and get more done and accomplish more and all that fun stuff. And now we're seeing this trend, I think, in the last couple of years anyway, more towards, hey, that stuff is good, but there's a better way to live. And it's more focused on being intentional right. instead of just trying to get all the things done. It's let's learn together how to focus on the most important things for you and your life. And I think that's a really positive trend. It's moving from a place of efficiency to effectiveness and intentionality. And I think we're seeing a lot of that too driven by everything in technology now with all the overwhelm that people are dealing with and information that we're constantly consuming. People are looking for a safe space because they're not quite sure how to process through all of that and deal with it. And I think one of the ways that that's coming out in productivity is this drive towards intentionality and focus. Well, and I think that's also attributed to the rise of paper planners too. Like the idea Absolutely. of pulling things out. And But what's interesting, and I was talking to someone about this the other day, is the idea that, you know, especially the bullet journal method, which, and I've had Ryder on the program before. And uh, I mean, I love the method, especially if you've read the book. And I think this is what happens, just like it happened with apps, is people hear about it. And then they go watch some YouTube videos or they go look up bullet journal and they see it, but they don't dig into the core elements of it, right? Like what we're talking about with right. the intentionality and attention, which is what I believe productivity is. Efficiency and effectiveness are byproducts of it. But 
then they go, okay, well, I got to get a nice notebook. And then I got to, oh, let me look at all the ways I can deck it out. And then ultimately what happens, they're like, okay, I've done all that. Oh my goodness, three weeks have gone by and I haven't used this thing yet, which is the same thing that happened with apps and things like Evernote where people get this app and say, oh, this will fix all my problems. I don't think that's really changed. And I think the core elements of personal productivity, what I love about your podcast and the work that you do is you've kind of done the same thing I've done, but without the early dance, right? (laughs) The early dance publicly, like you've been able to kind of take this, look at this from a philosophical vantage point and, and watch it. And then, cause that's where I think you're coming in is, is this, this productivity philosopher of sorts. I know that may sound a bit, you know, woo woo in that, but I think that that's what we need more of nowadays because I, I think there's always going to be this push for here's this great new tool. You should use it. And then there, you can fill it with all the things, but then, uh Oh, I can't do all the things. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, this, this actually kind of comes into what I was talking about just the other day when I was recording my podcast for this week, which uh, will be out for quite a long time now when this goes live in ears, but um, we can put a link into the show notes yep, to that. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's kind of what I ran into. I've been a bullet journal user for about a year now, and I was just running into issues with that. I was really into OmniFocus before mm-hmm. that. And the last year was just absolutely crazy and just blew up and Therefore, my system blew up, too, because I made it way too complex. And that's really what it, what it came down to was, like, it's so easy to just say, well, the tool, can, the tool can do that for me. Let me just throw it in the tool. The tool can be the Band-Aid solution. But in reality, like, I had to figure out how to use it in an effective way for me. Because, like, what I realized over time is that, for me anyway, I have ideas that I'm constantly working on or things that I think are cool or that I'm developing in some sense, but my task manager isn't the place for those to live. Right. And I was constantly over cluttering my system up with things like that. And so now what I've done is I've actually reincorporated OmniFocus into my workflow and I've got a few different stages involved with that um, where I have ideas and a, a project incubation type workflow. And the only things that end up in my task manager are things that I am actively committed to working on within the next couple of months. Well, and I think that's why a tool like Notion has really seen an increase in use and it really rose to prominence in 2019 is because it's got so much flexibility that you could, yeah, you could use it for like, I use it for long-term planning now outside of paper. Like I'm in the midst of uh, developing a paper planner as we, as we, you know, well, by the time this is recorded, we should be well into that phase or by the time this is aired rather. But I mean, the idea of, um, the idea of, of looking at these, our systems and you said, you know, like it became complex and I think complex is okay until it becomes complicated, right? Until it becomes like you can't possibly track it. And then you, you're sitting there overwhelmed by the whole, by the whole thing. And, and I think our job is to is to guide people like is to almost be that person that goes okay look does this really belong in your task app because that was the old thought right like hey put everything in OmniFocus put everything in things put everything in Todoist I used to be a big dealer in absolutes when it came to this stuff for example email I used to be like nope if it's an email if if it's an email that comes in and it's a task it should go to your task manager that's okay until you get a massive volume of email. And then all of a sudden you've now got email to manage and a task manager that's brimming over with emails. I hated the snooze option in email. I did not like it at all until I realized that I could leverage it until I said, okay, you know what? As long as, and, and the way I leverage it is by, you know, saying, oh, well, I get an email from like, say someone who wants to be on the podcast and I'm not ready to answer it. Like, let's say I get it today as we're recording it. I can either say, you know what? I'm going to snooze it till later today because today is my listening day, or I'm going to push it off to, you know, my planning day, I'll snooze it till then, or I'll snooze it until my next listening day, which is next Wednesday. That way it doesn't clutter up this, this, you know, master task list that can be quite overwhelming that I have to filter in the first place. So I think looking at these tools is really important paper and, and digital, and then figuring out, okay, how do I help someone use this in a way that works that can work for them 
because the tool, like like you get when you get a new phone, everything is active, right? Like all the notifications are on. That's not that means it's designed for the for the platform, not for the user. And I think that's that's the job that you know, I see you do, and I think it's the job that people who study productivity that's their job to do too. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's um, we've got to start thinking in terms of systems instead of tools. Yeah. And when you start thinking that way, it makes the whole process a heck of a lot easier to deal with. Like recently on an episode, I was discussing the concept of the basic building blocks of productivity. Mm -hmm. And I think traditionally in the productivity space, we've termed those as task manager, calendar and reference software. Right. But I really wholeheartedly disagree with that sentiment because the basic building blocks are really your commitments, intentions, and habits that you're trying to manage and Mm -hmm. everything else. Those task managers, reference softwares, and calendars are really just the ways you manage those things. Yeah, I would argue. They're they're, they're tools to augment that. Yeah, I would argue that the intentions are the things you need, which is what you mentioned. And those tools are just a way for you to pay attention to them. That's it. Absolutely. Meal planning is important because it prevents us from being a disappointed wreck when dinner time comes around and we have no clue what to make or even if we have the ingredients to make the meal. It's a time and a money saver, but most importantly, it frees up valuable brain space. Creating a meal plan prepares us for the week to come and gives us peace of mind that we're organized and can feed ourselves and our family. That's why I do it and that's why Plan to Eat helps me do it. Your subscription includes access to the Plan to Eat website and fully featured mobile apps on iOS and Android. And Plan to Eat gives you the tools to clip and organize recipes from any website, the ones your family loves and that fit your dietary preferences and needs. And you can create a meal plan around your schedule. Then what happens is the Plan to Eat software automatically creates an organized shopping list based on your plan. So sign up for your free trial at plantoeat.com slash timecrafting. That's plantoeat.com forward slash timecrafting. The coupon will be automatically applied to your account and can be used when you're ready to subscribe. It's valid for new customers only. Give Plan to Eat a try today. Okay, we're going to take a break from the conversation now to talk about the sponsor for this episode, Text Expander. And you can say goodbye to repetitive text entry, spelling and message errors, and trying to remember the right thing to say with Text Expander. You see, when you use Text Expander, you can say the right thing in just a few keystrokes. It's better than copy and paste. It's better than scripts and templates. Text expander snippets allow you to maximize your time by getting rid of the repetitive things you type while still customizing and personalizing your messages. I use text expander all the time for these sort of things because there's a lot of things that I need to type again and again, and I don't want to have to type them again and again. And text expander helps me from doing that again and again. Text Expander can be used in any platform, any app, anywhere you type. You can take your time back and increase your productivity with Text Expander, and I want you to be able to do that starting today. So visit textexpander.com slash podcast and get 20% off of your first year. Just go to that URL, textexpander.com slash podcast. Choose the Productivity is Podcast from the drop-down menu to let them know that you heard about Text Expander from me, and you'll get 20% off of your first year. I am a massive fan of Text Expander, and once you start using it, you're going to be a fan too. I'd like to thank Text Expander for sponsoring this episode of the Productivity is Podcast. Now let's get back to the program. So let's let's dig into why what got you into this. Like, I mean, I know that you touched on like you know you're in, but what led you to to the point where like I need to build a community around this. I need to start this podcast. Which, by the way, if you haven't listened to yet, um, we talked about this before we jumped on the air. It's like you know short digestible podcasts that especially if you're doing a productivity podcast probably ideal right (laughs) to get people like i can take what i need from this and then i can get on with my day or get on with my week um and you do you you cover that in spades in, in in your program but what led you to say hey you know what i need to i need to deliver this you know and become one of you know these these people that helps people with exactly what you're talking about yeah, well, that that's kind of an interesting journey, actually. I mean, I, I had been involved and interested in productivity and refining my systems for, you know, like I mentioned, a number of years now. Um, just a few years ago, I was seeking out community online, and I found one, um, and it's the community that I'm running now, uh, but it was under a different owner and a different name at that time. And just over time, I, I just really invested in that to try to connect with other people who were struggling with the same things that I was that didn't necessarily have people 
that I can talk to on the phone or, um, you know, meet with in light in life day to day, go have coffee with them or something like that to talk about personal productivity things. Mm -hmm. And so I got involved with this and started just sharing thoughts that I had struggles that I had and, and generating conversations about the systems that I was trying to develop and the process that I was trying to work through in building my own productivity system, being more effective, trying to be intentional, manage all the things going on in my life. And so long story short, I ended up acquiring that community and I now run it. And that's been a really fun process to have some good conversations with people about, hey, how do I do this thing in OmniFocus? How do I leverage these different tools different ways? Hey, is this possible to do something like this? But then over time, I realized that I have a lot more thoughts that I wanted to share. And at the time, there was a big hole in the productivity space that I noticed. And that was the short form podcast where we can just distill ideas down to try to be bite size and digestible in, you know, under 20 minutes, basically, because all the podcasts that were out there were at minimum uh, an hour in length, if not 90 minutes to two hours. And for a lot of people, that is just it's a big commitment to try to digest that, especially when there's so many good podcasts out there mm -hmm. and so many good blogs and TV shows that are demanding our attention or books to read. And so I wanted to kind of take the other direction with that. And that's why I launched Process uh, just about a year ago. And that's been a really fun journey to explore the thoughts and ideas that I've had and synthesize different concepts from different areas in, together into, hey, this is maybe how people can approach productivity. And th I think the big deal with it, too, is that there's a lot of one-size-fits-all solutions out there, but productivity is, I think, a process and a journey that each one of us has to walk down because it's unique to each and every one of us as well. Every one of us thinks differently, we process differently, we have different needs in different seasons for our lives, and these systems can help us navigate those things, but how it looks for each individual person is probably going to vary quite a bit. Let's talk about some of the things that you've steadfastly kind of stuck to over the years, and maybe even started as springboards to what you do now that have been really helpful because I think that again, the tools are our attention, um, tools, not intention, you know, they're not the thing that does the thing. It's the thing that helps you pay attention to the thing you need to do. What are, I mean, bullet journaling, you mentioned, um, what are some of the th things that you've put in place that have been like, let's not say game changers, but like they've been helped you be more thoughtful about choosing kind of what to chase. I think the big one is the mind sweep, just a standard getting things done mind sweep. But the, the key with this one is, is I didn't really fully understand what a mind sweep was until I read an article. I can't even remember where I found it, but a long time ago where it kind of spelled out, this is maybe what you can use a mind sweep for. I used to think of just a mind sweep as let's get all the tasks out of your head. Yeah. Typical brain dump kind of yeah. getting things done thing. Yeah. Yeah. But what has really been effective for me in that regard has been not just focusing on the tasks, not just focusing on the projects or ideas that I have there, but also focusing on what am I experiencing? What am I feeling? Because a lot of times those are things that are causing me to lose focus and lose attention in my day. I am, I'm a pretty emotionally sensitive person. I mean, I don't necessarily show it on my face all the time, but I'm very aware of what's going on in the world around me, when my kids are having a rough day or my wife's having a tough day or something like that, if there's crazy stuff going on in the world around me, it affects me sometimes. And so I have to be intentional to recognize that in that process. Otherwise, I just totally get stuck in that space. And so part of what a mind sweep does for me is not only just get a sense of what's going on in my life that I need to do but also what's affecting me. Because when I ad address or identify things that are affecting me, I can handle it and then move past it so that it doesn't slow me down or cause me to lose focus in other areas. Another thing that I have done too, and this is really high level and really theoretical, is try to put myself in environments where I have freedom to make choices. I know a lot of us, um, especially people who tend to work 
in corporate office environments and things like that, we, we regularly have people telling us what to do. Right. Hey, I need, I need this done by Friday. Hey, I need this report on my desk. And those kind of situations tend to remove our freedom. And in instances, I mean, we feel like we have to do something that we don't necessarily have the choice. But if I'm intentional to put myself in situations where I give myself freedom, the one thing that happens there is that it often surfaces areas that I'm struggling with in my life. So if I have freedom at work, I work remotely for a company called Discourse. And so we're 100% remote. I don't see anybody uh, except for maybe a video call every once in a while. I'm completely autonomous in how I handle my day. There may be tasks that get assigned me and stuff like that, but I'm in charge of when I get them done um, and things like that. And one thing that being in that type of environment has done for me has caused me to realize that when I don't have clarity, that I have to get clear. I have to be way more intentional about being clear of what my action plan is for the day. And so giving myself freedom and being in these situations where there's not this external pressure on me to do things or get things done has really helped me identify weak points in my workflow and weak points in my day to day and in my mindset too, toward getting things done and staying on task and all that fun stuff. What do you think some of the biggest roadblocks people have to kind of adopting a more intentional, uh, viewpoint of productivity? I would have to say is getting too hung up on specifics. Okay. I think, I think, I think one of the challenges that I see oftentimes in the productivity space is that like we have to have the system planned out and I have to know exactly what tags I'm going to use in my OmniFocus. Mm -hmm. I have to know, you know, how I'm going to handle this email. I have to know where everything is going to go. I have to have it all perfectly set up. I struggle with this. I've done this so many times in the past. And I think probably one of the ways to get around that is to start to build an iterative mindset toward productivity. Start where you are now. Be okay with that. You don't have to have it all figured out. You don't have to have this rock star system. Because I know a lot of us in the productivity world can we can come across sometimes that we have it all figured out, but I know I definitely don't. <laughs> yeah, we're really good at optics that way. <laughs> I mean, we're running a business. We got to sound, you know, authentic we, and authoritative but, on the subject. But right? there's that phrase, we teach what we need to learn the most, right? Absolutely. And so I think one of the things to do is just recognize that, like, you don't have to have it all figured out to be intentional. The, uh, the, the adage you can't steer a parked car really perfectly works in this instance because if you're so caught up on trying to figure out the specifics, then you're not really moving forward. And so the best thing to do is to just start. Right. Try being intentional. I think another thing too is to get over the idea that you have to have these big long-term plans because life happens. Mm -hmm. You just need to choose what's important to you, what, what you value in life and start doing small things in those directions and then see where it takes you. That's where like, I like to talk about, and that's why my podcast is named Process, is because it's all a process. It's all a journey. Every single time in my life that I have set a goal that's going to take me more than three months to complete, I have had to completely erase it from the map because something has happened two to six weeks in yep. that completely changes it. So I don't do goals anymore, but I'm still trying to be intentional because I'm learning what my values are. And my values help me make decisions. And those decisions are things, when they're in alignment with my values, that get me going where I want to go. It doesn't have to look like something concrete or achievement-based where it's like I can say I've got this concrete thing that I've done or made at the end of it, though those things are valuable and I definitely do those things. But it's more about becoming the person that I want to be. What books are you kind of reading now or have read? that when you read them, you're like, because, and I'll, I'll, I'll preface this, I'm not reading as many productivity books per se nowadays. I mean, there's so many that you could keep reading and reading. And I mean, I do occasionally reread Getting Things Done and I've read, you know, James Atomic Habits. And there's obviously ones I read for this podcast, but I'm a nonfiction book reader. And I love to read books that kind of don't necessarily fall inside the realm of productivity and time management, but yet I can still 
relate to them or I want to go deeper. Like, for example, right now, as of this recording, I'm reading The Order of Time, which is like, ugh, it's like a physicist's view of time. It makes you really think about that. What kind of book, what books have you read? Maybe at least a couple or maybe one even that that changed your perspective on the kind of stuff that you talk about and that, that you've been, you know, kind of exploring in ways that you didn't anticipate. I think the one that's really hit me in the last year was the book range by David Epstein. Yeah, I've heard so many good things about that too. Yeah, oh I, man, it, that book is so good. Yeah. It's, it's on my list for sure. It's, I mean, I remember when I saw it come out, the reason I loved it is I'm like, Oh, I like the book cover. So I, I'm like, I should use something like that for my book cover when we are putting time crafting out. But to be fa- I mean, it, I looked at it like the idea that being a generalist, uh, and then I think he digs in deeper, but you should, I mean, touch on it because I've not read it yet. And it's definitely one that's been on my list. Yeah. I think, I think that concept of being a generalist is one that really resonated with me when I even saw the subtitle of the book before I even ordered it on Amazon. Uh, what, because I know I'm a generalist, I tend to think broadly. I tend to like to learn from different subject areas. My background is pretty broad. I work for a software development company right now, or a company that produces software, but I have a background in customer service and IT and lots of different stuff. Obviously, I'm involved in productivity. And so that generalist message really speaks to me in a lot of regards. And I think what really hit me about that book is this concept that we've been getting sold so hard in the last few decades that specialization and being an expert in the field is the way to go. But in reality, that only works in a few different fields. And that's because there's a certain rhythm to things in those fields where if you specialize so hardcore in it, it actually gives you an edge. But nowadays in today's knowledge work based economy, We need more creative solutions to problems. And a lot of times these solutions are found from having a more generalist mentality. We can draw conclusions from patterns we've seen in other areas of life. So that's the general premise of the book. And what that really resonated me for was just, it gave me a level of freedom and almost validation, I guess, for me being a generalist is like, this is okay. Mm -hmm. But it's also, I think, an empowering mindset to have to creatively look at situations and say, okay, I can think through this thing. I can think through this problem and there might be other patterns that I can recognize in other areas or a solution might dawn on me from another book that I read that's completely unrelated to that situation um, that I can apply in this type of situation. So it's not necessarily directly productivity related, but it really impacts the way that I think about work and problem solving because I mean, in reality, that's what we're all doing these days anyway in a knowledge work type fields. We're problem solving things. We're figuring out process. We're figuring out end to end solutions. We're figuring out how to help people or creative ways to get around roadblocks, things like that. As we wrap up today, Justin, first off, I want to thank you, but I want to ask you one more question. If someone's walking away from listening to this episode right now, which is just a shade longer than your, you actually, it's, it's probably double the length of your usual podcast, but what's one thing that they could do today that you think would help them with their productivity process? I would say if you're stuck, go to something analog. Mm -hmm. And the reason I say that is because I mentioned that I picked up a bullet journal, you know, I started that process about a year ago. And the reason for doing that was because my life blew up. I had a lot of other stuff going on and my systems got too complicated. But using the bullet journal in particular really helped me solidify what things were necessary in my system and what things were missing. And I've been able to kind of revisit things here and there through that process. And, you know, and and like I mentioned, I'm back into OmniFocus now, but I still have the bullet journal in my workflow because I feel like it's really good at handling more stream of consciousness or chronological things in my life. Right. But then OmniFocus is a little bit more freeform when it comes to project structuring. And then I've got Notion that I'm also using as a project planner too. But it's a... I think it's a little liberating if a person is stuck to just start on paper, figure it out that way and not worry about having all the details right. Because paper is really forgiving in that regard. If you mess something up, you just scratch it off. Or if you don't need it anymore, you just scratch it off. Well, I think that's yeah. one thing. 
And what I love, I mean, I'm a hybrid guy too. So I've been like, you know, uh, the, the power of the ping can be really compelling. And with analog, it, it uh, it's not going to ping at you. It's not going to run out of battery life. Plus you get to use, I mean, if you're like me, you love bear and fig stuff. You get to use nice little, nice little uh, pens and paper products. So there's always that too. Yeah, absolutely. I'm a like term guy, but that's, <laughs> I do like uh, my I, nice pens. By the way, I learned that that's, it's pronounced Loistrum. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I actually did a video about the Bullet Journal because uh, I actually have the Kickstarter edition of the Bullet Journal method. Uh, I backed it when it came out. And uh, I went online and there's actually a YouTube video because I'm like, how do you pronounce this thing? Because I had to say it for the YouTube video. And I found it and there was a uh, there was a rep and she there was a craft fair, I think. And she said, we've been learning, for, trying to figure out for years how to pronounce this thing. How do you, he goes, Loistrum, 19, it's at 1917. Loistrum, it's Loistrum. So there you go. It's interesting. Nice. So there you go. You've learned something new today. I, I sure hope have. I hope uh, my I, I know that my audience has and I have too. Justin, thanks so much for joining me today on the program. Where can people learn more about you and keep up with you and your work? The main place right now is EffectiveRemoteWork.com. That is my community. You can find the podcast process at podcast.EffectiveRemoteWork.com. And I do some light microblogging at JustinDeRose.com. Thanks again for joining me, Justin, on the Productivities Podcast. Pleasure to be here.